Udayfa radiallahu anhu ibn Usayd al-Ghifari, he says the, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to us all of a sudden as we were in a busy discussion. He said, what are you talking, what are you discussing, what are you talking about? They said, we're discussing about the last hour. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, it will not come until you see ten signs. And the reason we're starting with this hadith is that when we start with the Dajjal, we're entering into the ten major signs before the Day of Judgment. So the Prophet said, you will not see it. These are ten signs that come before the Day of Judgment. And then he made a mention of the smoke, the Dajjal, the beast, the rising of the sun from the west, the descent of Isa ibn Maryam, so far we have five, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, that's six, and three landslides, one in the east, one in the west, one in Arabia, at the end of which a fire will burn forth from Yemen and will drive people to their place of assembly. Another interesting hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, Abdullah ibn Umar narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi that the signs, he said that the signs are like the signs, meaning the major signs, the signs of the Day of Judgment are like beads on a string. I've got a string that has beads on it. Okay, it's not tied off at the end. If I flip it this way, what happens? Prophet said, once the string is cut, the bead will fall in quick succession. They'll fall right after the other. So the signs are like that. These ten signs we mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, we don't know the exact order of all of them. But for sure, for sure, we know the following. We know that, even though this is a minor sign, the Mahdi during his lifetime, the Dajjal comes because he fights the Dajjal. And then we said on that second Fajr, Isa alayhi salam descends. So Mahdi, Dajjal, Isa. Isa alayhi salam kills the Dajjal. And before they can even celebrate, he's informed that Ya'juj and Ma'juj have broken out. So that means that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are in that order. So that these top first three, Dajjal, Isa alayhi salam, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. No disputing it. If you, you cannot dispute these three. Because those who have, who have tried, they, they ran into some serious problems. There's one person, like I mentioned before, he has a picture of the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, that they've already come out, according to him. If they've come out, that means the Mahdi has come, the Khilafah has come, Bayt al-Maqdis has been set free, the civil war came, Isa alayhi salam descended, the Dajjal came. Where is all this? That's why we said that rule, remember? Now it comes in handy. Follow the chronology. Follow the order. You can't just skip around. And the last sign will be the great fire. As for the order of the signs in between, even the Prophet ﷺ himself doesn't know that. I said that one time, and someone commented that said, you shouldn't say the Prophet ﷺ didn't know. Those were the exact words. I mean, well, the Prophet ﷺ, in so many words, indicated that he didn't know which one came before the other. And that's not to take away from his greatness, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The knowledge of the unseen, knowledge of the future is with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, uh, the Dajjal. First of all, the Dajjal is not mentioned in the Quran. And I've seen some, some contemporary speakers, and they're not, they didn't formally study the religion like, you know, but they just speak about it. So this person said that the Dajjal is not real and there's no such thing as the Dajjal. Actually, two people have said that. And then their arguments were as follows. One of them said, because one, we've scoured the earth and we can't find him. I mean, I don't even know, that, is, it, is this worth re refuting or is it so, so unintelligent that you just have to repeat it to refute it? <laughs> the other person said that the Dajjal cannot be. Because how can this be the greatest fitna since the creation of Adam and yet it is not mentioned in the Quran? Let me tell you something very important here. Only people who have serious problems with the sunnah make statements like that. The rest of us, we ex we, the Quran is a source of legislation, the authentic sunnah is a source of legislation. We accept both, we don't have any problem with that. Only someone who is crooked and has problems with the sunnah will make a statement like that. How come it's not in the Quran? Because you have a problem with the sunnah. But if you don't have a problem with the sunnah, if it's not in the Quran and it's in the sunnah, I'm okay with that. If it's not in the Sunnah, it's in the Quran, I'm okay with that. If it's in both, I'm okay with that. What's the problem? 
Very, like, that's one of the red flags. When someone says, it's not in the Quran, it's only in the Sunnah. He, so the scholars res if responded to this by saying, there is something far more important than the Dajjal that's not mentioned in the Quran. And it, that is the number of rak'at for Maghrib prayer. That is immensely more important than the, 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 the Dajjal being mentioned. If anything is important that should be mentioned, the number of rak'at in the salawat should be mentioned in the Quran. Because the Dajjal will only affect a small portion of this Ummah. But this will affect the entire Ummah, the number of rak'at in Al-Maghrib. And Allah Azza wa didn't mention it. You know why? Because it's in the Sunnah. And as long as you don't have a problem with that, it doesn't matter if it's mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah, or both, or one or the other. Only people who have problems have that issue. So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, this hadith I just alluded to, Sahih Muslim, there is no affair, there is nothing between the creation of Adam and the hour greater than the Dajjal. This is the biggest trial, the biggest fitna test ever. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, I warn you of him. And there is not a single Prophet except that he warned his people, or he also warned his people of the Dajjal. However, I will mention something which no Prophet mentioned before to his people. So why is the Prophet ﷺ giving us extra detail? Because one thing we know for sure is that he will emerge during our time, in, meaning in this Ummah. So that, that's why our Ummah has more information than the Dajjal. One of the interesting things is that when every Prophet, like can you imagine Ibrahim ﷺ warned his Ummah of the Dajjal. Musa ﷺ warned his Ummah of the Dajjal, his, his followers of the Dajjal. And one of the things is that also it shows the importance. It's something that's so important that everybody's been warning about it for a long time. So the Prophet then said, he's going to tell us something that no other Prophet mentioned before, and that is, he is one-eyed and your Lord is not one-eyed. So, let me talk about the name of the Dajjal and then give you bulleted points on his description. The name at Dajjal, uh, Al-Masih or Al-Masih uh, Al-Dajjal, means... Someone that is a liar. So he's a deceiver, an imposter, a liar. That's why his name is a Dajjal. His description is that he is short in stature and with a wide stance, a prominent forehead and a large body. Then he has whitish skin complexion. Thick curly hair. What's interesting is that the Prophet ﷺ described the, the hair of the Dajjal and he always described the hair of Isa alayhi salam. And it's almost to say, this Masih is not like that Masih. The Isa alayhi salam, soft, long hair, looks like he's wet, very limp hair. And so every time he moves, it looks like it's falling, as if it's wet. And the Dajjal, thick, curly hair. So we're seeing a clear difference between them in the physical description, so nobody gets confused. Then, he's one-eyed. Now, it's sad that a lot of people think that Dajjal is a, a cyclops. He has one eye in his forehead. First of all, let's be clear that the Dajjal is a human being. Even though Allah gave him abilities beyond ours, meaning being able to stay alive and healthy for a long time. But he is a human being. He's not from the jinn. He's not an angel. He's not some other creature created for this task. He's a human being. So when someone is speaking about a human being and says, this human being is one-eyed, what do you instantly, what does everybody understand, even children, that this human being has one good eye, and one bad eye. That's what it means. You don't imagine a human being with one eye in his forehead. So the, the gel is not a cyclops. There's a video of this boy was born in uh, Turkey or something many years ago and born with one eye in the middle like that. So they, they took the video and they're playing Quran and the question mark, is this the Dajjal born? First of all, the Dajjal is already alive. Okay, just get your facts right. The Dajjal is already alive. Second, now this family, it's bad enough they got a child with one eye and now they have to find a video of you calling him the Dajjal on the internet. The point is, one eye is damaged and it's not functional. And we have um, Qad Iyad from the hadith of Ibn Umar mentions that it's dull, like cloudy, and he's unable to see from that eye. His left eye has this thick fold over it and it's defective. And A'war can describe anything defective. It doesn't have to be like there's a big hole where his eye used to be. The eye could still be there, but defective. It doesn't have to be blind completely, but, but we, we have other hadith describing him as such. So it could be that one of them is just non-functional or the other is defective. But the Prophet ﷺ said, and know that your Lord is not A'ur, your Lord is not one-eyed. Because 
he in the beginning, the Dajjal is going to claim to be a prophet. But then later on, he's going to claim to be Allah, astaghfirullah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And don't you think it would be so obvious and clear to people that how can he be your Lord and he's got a bad eye? I mean, you're telling me you created me and him and her and all of us have better eyes than you and better eyesight. And you're blind in one of them. You can't fix your own. Another interesting question, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the flaw of the Dajjal in his eyes? Like why not broken teeth? You know, why not very bad breath? Something that when, you know, he has to open his mouth to before you realize it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the flaw in the first place your eyes will fall. Like when you see a human being, do you notice their shoulder first? Do you notice their earlobe first? You look at their eye immediately as you're being introduced to someone, you first lock eyes with them. If the Dajjal's flaw was in his teeth, for example, and he looked normal otherwise, so you'd look at him and he'd look like a normal person and everything, and then when he opens his mouth, oh, his teeth are horrible. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the flaw in the first place you'll look so that you catch it immediately. And it can't be that your Lord who created the heavens and the earth and all these eyes on earth of animals and sea creatures and human beings, his eye is bad and he can't fix it, but he'll fix yours. It doesn't make any sense. But despite all that, people will still believe in him. People will still follow him. So uh, then we, uh, others mentioned that the right eye will protrude, other narrations, the right eye will protrude like a grape. Uh, the left eye will be murky, cloudy, unclear, as if there is a thin layer of film on it or a thick piece of flesh mentions also. Then between his two eyes will be written the words ka fa ra. I've already made that joke about how he does have two eyes, he's not a television set, he's actually a human being. Between his eyes, anyone literate or illiterate who is a believer can read ka fa ra and they will spell out kafir and they'll know that he's a kafir. And one of the good uh, pieces of news is that he has no children. We said he's a human being. And the Prophet ﷺ, to give the companions of an idea of what he looked like, and he would do this with, when he described Ibrahim ﷺ, he said he's the one who resembled him the most. When he described uh, Isa ﷺ, he described which companion looks like him the most. And he described a Dajjal, and he says the one who looks the most like him is Ibn Qatan. And uh, which tells you that he's just a normal looking person, except for the bad eyes. But it's not like a monster or another creature or anything like that. Before the, the Dajjal emerges, one of the things is that people will have forgotten his name and his mention. Imam Ahmad narrates, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Dajjal will not emerge until the people will forget his mention and the Imams neglect to speak of him from the pulpits. And that's why it's important every now and then to make sure we keep a mention of this of this Dajjal, there will be many wars and there will be severe drought and famine. The Prophet ﷺ describes in this hadith, in the f this is the, th the three years before the Dajjal emerges. In the first year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the sky to withhold one third of its rain and the ground to withhold one third of its vegetation. Then in the second year, Allah will command the sky to withhold two thirds of its rain and the ground two thirds of its uh, vegetation. In the third year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the sky to withhold every drop of rain. The Prophet ﷺ says, so it will not rain a single drop on earth. And it will command the, the ground to withhold all its, all its vegetation. And the Prophet ﷺ said, not a single plant will grow. And all hooved animals will die except for Allah wills. Meaning a small number will remain. So the companions asked, how will, will people eat, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ explained to them by saying, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, and La ilaha illallah. By saying these words, it's like nutrients will enter your bloodstream and you will have energy as if you ate. And then Ibn Kathir, Rahimahullah, who died about you know, 800 or so years ago, he comments on this saying, this is from the importance of teaching this subject matter to your children, and they teach it to their children so that whatever of your offspring is alive at that time, they know how to behave, they know how to act during those times. So these will, there will be difficult times, this starvation and all this happening, famine. The Prophet mentions he will come out because or due to an extreme anger that he will feel. And we don't know the exact cause of this anger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And he will appear from the direction of Khurasan. Another narration mentions he will be with 70,000 of the Jews of Isfahan specifically. And Sahih Muslim, we said it will be due to an extreme anger that he will feel that he will emerge. 
and uh, no one knows exactly why. One of the best educated guesses I found from one of the scholars, he said that if you look right at the, like even at this, the moment before he comes out, it is just victory after immense victory for the believers. And then right after he, we, the Muslims conquer Constantinople without shooting a single arrow, remember we spoke about this hadith, then someone yells out that the Dajjal has come out. So they go check, when they come back, they find out that it's false news, you know, like it's like a false information, and then right then and there, he does come out. So we're seeing it right after this great victory and a number of great victories for the believers. Could that be why he's upset? Allah Ta'ala A'lam is very, very possible. The question becomes also, is he alive today? He's alive today. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala intended for his place and position to be hidden. So you can't tell me if he's alive, how can we not find him? Some grown men are saying that. Because, let me repeat it one more time. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala intended for no one to find him. That's why you don't know where he is. Is that simple? That's number one. Number two, they say, well, how can he be alive since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu You know, by the time he comes out, he'll be old and, and tired and, and have cataracts and have, you know, diabetes. So time does not take its toll on him. What do you think? This is Allah's plan, that this man is, is waiting to come out. And Allah, and he, you're, you're accusing Allah what? Of not planning well, that forgetting that this man's going to come out ill, old, dead, thousands of years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and he's the best of planners. What's an, another thing that's interesting, even though I'm not going to get into the story of Ibn Sayyad, but at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a young man that the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning thought might be the Dajjal. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ thought a man, this young man, could be the Dajjal, doesn't that tell you that the Dajjal is a human being and a man? Not a system. Yeah, if we've, we're, like if there's anything we're sick and tired of, it's these speakers who are saying that the Dajjal is a system, or it's a chip, it's the British. But we're not going to claim anyone is the Dajjal just because we don't like them or their government or a system or, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a system. It's not a currency. It's not a chip that will be inserted into people. It's not a secret organization. Or they pave the way for the Dajjal. There is nothing paving the way for the Dajjal. And the hadith don't mention anyone assisting him besides the shayateen. The Dajjal, yes, he's alive in Sahih Muslim, a companion by the name of Tamim al-Dari. This man, he, was, uh, he came from Palestine. He was a Christian man who met the Dajjal. And the Dajjal asked him about the Prophet ﷺ. So as a Christian then, what is his next move from when he leaves the Dajjal? He leaves that gathering, where is his next place to go? Only one place on earth. You have an experience like this, and he asks you about a genuine Prophet alive at that point, you leave from there straight to that Prophet. So Tamim anhu went straight to the Prophet ﷺ and took his shahada. Then the Prophet ﷺ gathered everyone and says, I have gathered you here because Tamim al-Dari from Palestine in that area he went he was on a boat with 30 people and then the wave tossed him about for a month then they stopped at this island then they were met by this beast now they don't know which direction because they were lost then this beast came up to them it had so much hair we could not see its front from its back he's saying we said what are you it said I'm al jassasa it's basically the spy for the the judge getting information for him and it asked them a few questions, and then they said, there is a man in the monastery, he's very eager to meet you. So when it said that to us, we got scared, thinking this might be the devil. How does he know about the devil? Remember, he's Christian. This might be some devil's island, because there's this weird beast that's so hairy, and yet speaks our language. So we went there, and he said, we found this man that was heavily shackled, chained up against the wall. They asked him who he was, he said, I'll, I'll tell you, but let me ask you a few questions. Then he asked him about the lake of Tabariya, Tiberias. He said, is there still water in it? They said, yes. He said, soon there'll be no water in it. Then he asked him, asked him of the days, about the dates of Baisan. Do they still bear fruit? They said, yes. He said, soon they will not bear fruit. Then he asked him about the well of Zughar. Is there water in it? They said, yes. He said, soon there will be no water in it. Now I'll tell you who I am. I am a Dajjal. Soon I will be allowed to leave this place. Then he described to them how he will travel the earth in 40 days. First will be like a year. Second will be like a month. Third will be like a week. And the rest will be like 
normal days. And he will enter every city except Mecca and Medina. Every time he tries to enter them, there will be an angel with an unsheathed sword that will stop him from entering. So Tamim radiallahu anhu, he immediately left from there, went to the Prophet وسلم, became Muslim, and then the Prophet gathered people and told them the story of Tamim. Indicating that the Dajjal, yes, is a human being and he's been alive since that time. And as the scholars mentioned, time does not take its toll on his body. And that's why he'll be able to remain alive for a long time. So we said he claims to be God. We said he stays for 40 days, but the first day will be a year long. Some scholars said because it's a major calamity, it will seem like it's a, a year long. But others said, no, it will actually physically be as long as a year. So that one day will have the same amount of hours or it will be just as long as an entire year. And that's why the companions asked the Prophet wasallam, how will we pray when that happens? And he tells them that they will estimate the prayer time. But the second day will be like a month long, and the third day will be a week long, and then the rest of the days will be normal. So the scholars mentioned, why this decrease? It comes off so powerful and the day is equal to a year, then it goes down to regular days. Because they said, the falsehood, its nature is to weaken, its nature is to disappear, and to dissipate, and to go away. And by its nature, it is bound to perish. And the, so no one will have, or no nation will be strong forever. No ruler will be strong forever. No king will be strong forever. The Dajjal, nobody like that will be powerful. For, they will immediately start to get weak. And that ultimate strength is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He travels the earth, like the hadith mentions, like wind-driven rain. Very quickly he moves around the earth. He'll come to a village. And people, remember, they've been starving now. So he comes to a village and he tells people that he's their God. And he'll do a number of tests. One, he'll have with him a river of water and a river of fire. He tells them, you believe in me, you can drink from this water. If you disbelieve in me, I'll throw you in this fire. The Prophet wasallam said, if you're alive at that point, and if, in, then close your eyes and drink from the fire, it will be water. It will be cold water. So why close your eyes? Because it's, you're seeing actual flames. It's hard to just... Put your face in flames, but close your eyes, drink from it, it will actually be cold water. Whereas those who believe in him, when they jump into the water, it will be like the hellfire, basically. They're entering the hellfire. So that's one. The other is that he'll come to this village and he'll say, you know, I'm your Lord. And he'll command the, the clouds to rain and it will rain instantly and vegetation will grow instantly. And the animals will eat from it and their udders will fill with milk instantly. So those who believe in him... He will leave them in that good state and those who disbelieve and they'll be even hungrier and, and there'll be more poverty when, when he leaves them. It's a very difficult test. Not only that, but the shayateen will assist him. The Prophet told us in the hadith that the Dajjal will come to a man and say, you know, if I bring back your mother and father, bring them back to life, will you believe that I'm your Lord? He said, yeah. And then two shayateen will come and assume the exact physical appearance and voice of his parents. So imagine someone, there, his parents died 40 years ago, and now it's his exact dear sweet mother in the flesh, same voice, everything, his father. Now they've both died and experienced death, so they come back, and it's not them, it's the jinns, right? They come back and they say, our son, he is our Lord, you know, believe in him, and the person will believe. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, if you see how difficult these tests are, he said, if you hear about him, do not go to him. Run. You run the other way immediately. Don't try to convince him, talk him out of it, give him da'wah. None of that. Just run the other direction. How do you safeguard yourself from the Dajjal? We have a number of things. Number one, run away. Don't go to him. Oh, let me convince him. Let me talk him out of it. Wherever you hear he is on earth, you go the other direction. That's one. Number two, of course, with anything, whether it's the biggest trial or the simplest trial, seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His protection. Number three, if you can live at the time of the Dajjal, and if you're alive, and if you can live in Mecca or Medina, do it. So of course, real estate value is going to really go up. Now, learning about the Dajjal and teaching others about him, that helps you protect yourself from him. How? Of course, if you're learning about him, you're learning about his attributes, 
how it says kafir on his forehead, how he has a bad eye, the other eye had a, like a flap of skin hanging over it and is murky or cloudy. You know about him, you know his description very well. How is he going to fool you after you know about him? Number five then would be knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing the attributes of Allah, learning the attributes of Allah. How does that help protect you from the Dajjal? Well, just like the Prophet said, kept saying in the hadith, your Lord is not one-eyed. If I understand the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa I know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what his descriptions are, then there's no way I would think a man walking on two feet with a bad eye is my Lord. Then, reading and memorizing from Surah Al-Kahf. Okay, now listen to this. In Sunan Al-Tirmidhi, the Prophet says that the first three verses of Surah Al-Kahf will protect you from a Dajjal. In Sahih Muslim, the first 10 verses protect you from the Dajjal. In another narration in Sahih Muslim, the last 10 will protect you from the Dajjal. And then another hadith mentions reciting the complete surah on Fridays. One way to be safe, memorize the first 10 and the last 10 and you've covered every narration. Something else, you can seek refuge from the Dajjal because as we know, after the last tashahud and before you say Assalamu Alaikum in Salah, you say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr. You seek refuge with Allah from the punishment of the grave. Wa min adhab jahannam. And from the punishment of the hellfire. Wa min fitnat al-mahya wal-mamat. And the trials and, and, and tribulations of life and death. Wa min sharri fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. And from the evil affliction of al-masih al-dajjal. In Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, this hadith. So all these to protect yourself from the dajjal. Now, it's interesting that uh, the story of the Dajjal doesn't end without entering into the story of Isa alayhi salam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.